Welcome, everybody, to this episode of Res Dog Walkers. My name is Dallas Smith, and I'll be your host until we find a sponsor that wants to get rid of me. Um, we've come together today in Musqueam, Squamish, Sabotu territory to interview a couple guests and continue the dialogue. We've started up this podcast series to try to get a little bit more granular on the discussions around reconciliation, self determination, and whatever else I see fitting to talk about for the day. I've been fortunate enough to be in the role that I've been in for a number of years and been asked to share thoughts at many conferences and events, but I've never really had a platform where I've got to sit up and kind of ask the questions I want to ask or have the discussion a little bit more detailed about some of the things that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Reconciliation's a challenge. There's no textbook that tells us how to do it. And so I'm really hoping that through this podcast series, people get a little bit better context around some of the thought process that goes into First Nations decision making and how we decide to protect resources and how we decide to manage resources. At the end of the day, it's all for the betterment of our communities. And if each nation looks after their own communities, we really start to make some dynamic change that's required to achieve some of the goals that lots of politicians like myself stand up and talk about from time to time. We've been in this age now of UNDRIP for a couple of years where governments have acknowledged the need for First Nations to have self-determination, but they're not sure how to get there. And so I really look forward to bringing a number of guests and people who have helped to share how they're taking that discussion forward, how they're choosing the path that works for their communities. And so today we're really looking forward to having a good friend of mine, uh, Chief Ronnie Chikite from the Wewakai Nation. We're going to have him come in and share some of the economic prosperity and some of the discussions that his community is involved in. And we might even talk about this ongoing football rivalry that him and I have being a devoted Cowboys fan that I am and him being a diehard 49ers fan. It's led to some interesting discussions in our relationship. And then we're also going to have Catherine Gordon. Catherine Gordon is the author of a book called This Place is Who We Are. It's a breakdown of stories from the Great Bear Rainforest. As many of you know, I've spent my entire career within the Great Bear Rainforest. And so to be able to write the foreword for her book, which really told some of the individual nation stories or individual people within nation stories after the land use deal was done. And so trying to figure out where First Nations communities fit after the table's sort of been set is part of that dialogue that I was talking about. So... We're really looking forward to getting on with today's show, and I'd like to welcome Chief Ronnie Chikite. How are you, Ronnie? Uh, good morning, Dallas. Uh, thanks for, for having me on your show, finally. You bet. Lots going on. I don't even really know where to start. I, I really appreciate your time. I know, I know we're both busy people, and I need to appear a little busier than I am, being that you're one of the guys who signs my paycheck, so maybe we'll jump right into it today. Um, first of all, NFL, San Francisco. I'm going to have to wear that San Francisco jersey of yours every golf tournament for the next two or three years if my Cowboys can't figure out how to get their shit together. But what, obviously you're ecstatic. Has it been a pretty good playoffs for you? Oh, man. Like it's, uh, I mean, the last couple of years have been just so up and down, you know, so close to championship. You know, last year we were, you know, one went away to get in the Super Bowl. This year, you know, those playoffs were we're down, you know, we have statistics where, you know, you know, we're, we're not able to come back. Like those are the critics, you know, Shanahan can't get it done. And, you know, we come back and we win one. And then to, to go into that NSC championship game and being down as much as we're at half and, you know, reading all the doubters, we're over, we're done. And then it's just like, you know, like the in Dumb and Dumber, you're saying that there's a chance, and uh, <laughs> which you might call it. I mean, to me, it was just like, that's football. That's why we play 60 minutes. We play anything. Hockey, we play right till the third period. Like, game's not over until it's over. And it was just a, an amazing victory. Nice, nice. And um, I'm not going to lie, I, I, I started typing a few texts to you at halftime and then thought, you know what, I've watched enough football, I'll just keep my fingers to myself right now. But, you know, I'm glad it's playoff time, the cliches are out, but you've been busy, you and your nation have been busy. Starbucks, 
first indigenous owned Starbucks in Canada, I believe. Why don't, why don't you share share some of that with us? Yeah, that's a, an amazing story that we were able to uh, to tell as well. We um, a year ago we met uh, my economic development manager was at the Cando conference in I believe it was Winnipeg, and he he just ran into a couple of Starbucks executives, and they were just you know chit chatting over dinner, uh, just doing you know uh, introducing each other and. You know, we weren't really sure if we were going to get a Starbucks. We were looking for some sort of business uh, to, to come in. And, you know, we're obviously uh, looking to develop our lands. And, you know, we're looking at all options. And the, the Starbucks was an amazing story. You know, I've seen so many Starbucks on First Nation reservations across Canada. But to, to understand that we were the first licensed store is a great story. I believe there's one more that's opened up since then. But, you know, for us to be able to blaze the way, I feel for for nations across Canada was an amazing story. Well, and you know, we our our mutual friend brother Chief Chris Roberts from We Were Come Nation, um, you know, now you took that first indigenous Walmart away from him and now you got the Starbucks, so you kind of one upped your neighbor a little bit, which is always fun for shits and gigs around the work and tables that we sit at. Um, but yeah, Starbucks is great. I got to go there last last weekend and, you know, Tell us about some of the other clients that you have in there that just make the Starbucks fit. I mean, you've got your own clientele in your own little super cluster up there with what used to be a barren patch of third growth alder and, you know, shitty cedar. You guys have cleared that and been able to bring in quite some partners. So who all do you have up there now? Yeah, no, it, um, yeah, obviously we're developing all the time. You know, we own our own gas station, the Shell gas station, which we've had for, I believe it's close to 18 years or maybe close to 19, but I think it's 18 years. Uh, we, we have a Lee's Chicken partnership. You know, we also have our own uh, liquor store. We have our own cannabis store that's there. And then, you know, in the in the neighborhood, we also have a Finning uh, building. We also have a Dan Acres Property Solutions. And then BC Hydro is uh, another big, uh, big office in the back. And, you know, they're going to develop another large office starting in the fall, I believe, and hopefully have it finished in the uh, two years, but, um, yeah, no, we're, we're definitely building more, more buildings. So, you know, more traffic going by the, the coffee shop should be quite busy and just being in location wise, you know, our gas stations, you're quite busy during the summertime. So we anticipate it to be, you know, quite busy there. So it's, I think it's a perfect location, right? You're, you're a minute off the highway. Lots of times you want to, you know, traveling through town, if you want to go get a coffee, it's really a 20 minute ordeal when you got to go into town and out. And so, we feel this location is perfect, right? You just zip off, zip back on, you're on your way. Oh, definitely. And are you starting to see the change? I notice, you know, it's nice to see the young people, you know, even in beginning, you know, retail retail sales positions or whether it be working a cash register. Um, are you starting to see the impact of that, just the more livelihood and opportunity that you're creating for some of your community members in, in employment in some of these opportunities? Yeah, no, it's... Um... Like we have a couple of uh, members who are shift managers and one's a manager, uh, you know, they're, they're younger. And uh, I think we were, we're really hoping to target a lot of the, uh, the high school students, you know, this could be their first job, but also, you know, after school and, and fill in, but definitely during the, during the summertime, this would be a nice full-time employment, you know, close to home. So nice. Um, you did mention your other business there, your cannabis business, um, smoke signals, I believe. I'm trying to pretend like I haven't been there once a week since it opened, but um, maybe next time you talk to the manager, Res Dog Walkers is looking for a sponsor for our podcast. So um, how's that turned out? You know, we've, we've seen other nations dabble with it. I've noticed that you guys have built something there. And did you have a plan to move your um, your kind of temporary location? I guess it's, if it's temporary location, you're probably going to move it. But what do you have some plans around that around that business? Yeah, no, we do. We do have some uh, plans. Uh, Obviously, going into when we first opened up the the Sovereign store uh, last uh, last May, you know, we we had the plans to build the Starbucks and we needed a, a larger liquor store. So the current liquor store that we have will be just be the right size building to to house this uh, cannabis store. So we are gonna gonna be moving into the new store, I believe, hopefully by April May, possibly. We we need a couple months of renovations in the in the current liquor store. Um, but yeah, I think our our liquor store is projected to open for March. So, you know, hopefully we're we're not too far away. Just a few hangups just on supply issues in the past uh, few months. 
So hopefully they've got those sorted out now. Nice. And, you know, it, it's it's nice to actually shop there and see how far beyond just the general cannabis side of things that this the retail market is taking you. Um, I know I probably spent about, well, I won't want to say how much, but the bath bombs are quite popular in my household um, after a long day and just a lot of the other more healing products that are there. So I, I really want to congratulate you and your nation on having the vision to just get beyond something for what it's seen at and being able to put some investment and some opportunity and really grow an opportunity out to see where it can go. Um, you know, it's kind of jumping around a little bit because you and I share a lot of similar hobbies. Um, golf. You know, you and I get the chance to play in a lot of corporate fundraisers, both because of our roles as leaders of our communities, but we have a couple of our own that we kind of put on. Top three courses in British Columbia that you've got to play at a fundraiser at. Um, I imagine you probably got to say UBC because you guys took down the title last year in amazing fashion. But what's one of your favorite golf courses to play? Yeah, no, which one call it? Uh, UBC is definitely a, a nice, challenging course. Um, honestly, the couple that I would think are one of my faves, obviously Shaughnessy. Uh, I've had the, the opportunity to play there a couple of times uh, through Chief Wayne Sparrow. And it is a, an amazing, challenging course. Like, I don't think there's anything I've played harder than that. You know, I've traveled to Palm Springs and I've played a lot of courses down there, but definitely uh, Shaughnessy. Uh, Nicholas North was a nice, nice course. Um, and, you know, Stories Creek still got to be one of the, you know, local course, but it's still one of my faves. No, definitely. I mean, I think, you know, when, when you travel around, you play courses, but I think Story Creek's always sort of the measuring stick for me anyway, regardless of where I'm traveling and we're lucky enough to kind of play it when we can. Although you're similar to me. In fact, you probably, you work as hard as I appear to work um, between the three or four different jobs that you have to do, but maybe just quickly as we're starting to wrap up, um, how do you, how do you, manage to manage yourself you know you're you're a commercial fisherman by trade i know you've been doing that since you were you were a young young man and you know over the last couple of years you went into council and then you become chief and now you have all these businesses what's one of your secrets to just making sure you stay on top of things and make sure you don't drive yourself crazy um honestly you know the, the one thing that's kept me you know sane through this whole last little bit is you know family you know having having my wife behind me, hundred percent supporting, you know, with the things I do to, you know, bring what's best for the family due to my commercial fishing business, but also understanding that, um, you know, when I became the, the chief, you know, we, we had talked about, you know, you're, you're going to have to give up my time that we spend a bit together to hopefully betterment of our community and, and our family and, you know, the future as uh, future membership and, you know, to me, it was like there was just a big plan. If we were able to to achieve, we have some goals set, and I think we're achieving a lot of those goals. And you know, hats off to whoever comes into this role whenever my time is done. But it's uh, to me, it was just about you know, I wanted to see us progress more in the economic development. I just felt that we were stuck in a rut. You know, our lands were vacant for quite some time, but um, we've definitely turned that around, and you know, we have quite a few. Uh, fires in the oven right now so we're definitely on the go well i really want to you know extend my appreciation to you for joining me and i really hope you can come join us again and we can get into a little bit more detail on some of the other things that we work on but i'd like to thank you for being here and um best of luck week after or i guess it'd be next week um in las vegas yeah no it's going to be a fun uh a fun game and you know going to my first super bowl i mean it's a once in a lifetime event so you know obviously i'm hoping for the win but i mean it's sports right you you never know until the, the last minute ticks off the clock so thanks for thanks for your time dallas i really appreciate this you bet well make sure you clean that bosa jersey up because i believe i'm contractually obligated to wear it at one more numicals corporate challenge so i look forward to donning your 49ers jersey as super bowl champions and we'll see you soon buddy all right. Thanks, Dallas. Thanks, Ronnie. That's Chief Ronnie Chikite of the Wewakai Nation, one of our first guests on Res Dog Walkers. Oh, hey, oh, hey. I'm delighted to have my next guest, who's been a dear friend of mine for 
oh, 10, 12 years now, Catherine Gordon. Catherine Gordon's a writer. She's an author. I guess that's sort of the same thing. Um, she does play a role in communications with Nomokoa's Council, the organization that, that I pretend to run from time to time. But I'm um, really happy to have you with us this morning, Catherine. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you, Dallas. And thank you so much for having me on. This is just such a pleasure to be with you on this show. You know, you know, when we started, you know, spitballing for guests, you're definitely at the top of the list because you're one of the few people who've been through the different roles that we go through at Nomokos Council. Um, one of the reasons I started this podcast was because, you know, I don't like being pigeonholed. You, too often I get asked to speak at other people's events to their agendas. And we host what's called the BC Indigenous Resource Opportunities Conference in partnership with C3 Alliance. And over the years, we've started to take resource opportunities and include the conservation side of that, include how can we manage resources for the betterment of coastal British Columbia and the Indigenous communities within coastal British Columbia. And so, you know, that, that's a great opportunity. You know, we get together once a year in Nanaimo, April 20. 24th to 26th, I believe, in Nanaimo, and people share some of the presentations about the work they're doing, but that wasn't really enough for me. I wanted to get into the nitty-gritty of some of the things and get into a little bit, but I think we would definitely need to start with, not just because I wrote the foreword, but we need to start with your book. So what, why don't you introduce your book and give us a little bit of a, a synopsis on, on the book that you wrote in conjunction you bet. With. I'm just going to hold it up here. Hopefully people can see that. It's called This Place is Who We Are, Stories of Indigenous Leadership, Resilience and Connection to Homelands. And it was published by Harbour Publishing, thanks to uh, hands raised to them in May last year, 2023, with you uh, very graciously providing the foreword for the book, as you say. And the, and, and the book is uh, incredibly important to me because it's the culmination of several things. Partly what I've learned over the years, what you were just talking about, Dallas, is that Indigenous worldview of environmental management, if you like, that is very holistic, that brings together our place in the environment as human beings rather than separating us from it. What we use, how we live, what we do in the places that we live is so uh, integrated with the place itself. Uh, <clears throat> it's about making sure that resources are carefully managed and carefully used within the environment rather than separating us from them. And that Indigenous worldview, you know, at a time in our um, lifetime on this planet when we are so challenged by things like climate change and, all the, and, and just unsustainable resource use, and the, what I'll describe as a non-Indigenous worldview that really separates human beings from lands and waters, from, you know, conservation, meaning 100% protection as opposed to how humans relate to the land and water and also to each other in terms of how we manage the space. And the stories in the, in the book are very much intended to illustrate that Indigenous worldview you know, and, and really allow us to understand better why that makes so much sense compared to the non-Indigenous way of managing the planet where we draw lines around a map and, and say, this is yours and this is mine, and, and then start land wars over it. And, and we're seeing that today. And, and the tragedy of that is it's driving the planet and ourselves into oblivion. But the book is about hope, actually, because there is a better way to do it. And over the years, as you as you mentioned, I've been so fortunate to, you know, I've had this huge privilege of working with you, working with Nomicol's Council, working with Coast Funds, who helped make this book possible by sponsoring it, and, and a huge thank you, huge Gila Kessler to them for that, is, is um, uh, you know, I've managed to learn and, and meet some some of the people, like Chief Rami Chikai, who you were just speaking with, Chief Chris Roberts from Overcome First Nation, other people up and down the coast in what, uh, um, in the non-Indigenous world, we refer to as the Great Bear Rainforest. And so the book is telling some of those stories, illustrating some of those themes, 
through the voices of those people from up and down the coast, from Haida Gwaii, from Nishka lands, from uh, Kitimat, from uh, Heisler, from Hitchup Territory, the New Hawk, Wewakam, the Gwasala Nakwarak, and others, sharing their voices and providing their perspective on that idea of interconnection to land and place and water. And what I hope is that people who read the book um, start to understand how absolutely brilliant that way of uh, managing the landscape is, the sophistication of the governance systems and the resource management systems that go back 14,000 years, you know, non-Indigenous civilizations rose and fell multiple times over those 14 millennia. But here we are today, and your way of doing things is still very vibrant and alive and strong and sensible, notwithstanding all the challenges of colonization. And the the last thing I'll say before letting <laughs> you have another word again is, is you know, one, one of the things that I really appreciated uh, while I was doing the book and talking to people and they were sharing their stories was to actually understand the impact of colonization. You have to actually understand how brilliant those pre-colonial systems were and continue to be and that our future survival depends on understanding that. And it isn't um, enough to feel sorry about things like the residential school system and smallpox and we have to be very cognizant of all of those terrible things that were done but we actually have to relate what that means in terms of what the risk was to indigenous governance and resource management systems that pre-existed colonization and how important it is for us as non-indigenous settlers and allies to support the resurgence of that through things like the guardian programs the Hamaya stewardship network Indigenous laws and governance, Indigenous protected and conserved areas, all of those things that re-establish and reclaim Indigenous management, which will be our hope for the future. You know, and um, I almost wish the book was written before the GBR negotiations because it probably would have been easier, to be honest with you, because you really hit the nail on the head with, you know, for years as one of the people who was dumb enough to sit from day one of the Central Coast LRMP to the five different announcements of the Great Bear Rainforest. Um, you know, a lot of that context was just oblivious to 90% of the people at those planning tables. And so to be able to get through it and be able to keep that door open for that reintroduction of some of our Indigenous ways of life and governance and land management and getting people to understand that we're not simply dependent on a healthy ecosystem. We make a healthy ecosystem within our communities. And that mindset um, would have probably cut us down from the 18 years that it was to probably more like eight, nine years. Um, but I'm so glad that the story got to be told and to work with you closely on as it came together. You know, you did a miraculous job of working with Dr. Clyde and Chief Roberts, and there is this spectrum of young to more experienced people that you worked with. And I noticed that as it came together, each of them had a little bit of a, okay, oh, you're really going to share my story with the rest of the world. I thought this was just something you were working on. And so talk to me a little bit about just some of the, I don't want to say challenges because it's a process that we had to go through to keep everybody comfortable with the book at the end of the day. I know you were very very, very clear about not wanting it to have any negative connotations when it was done. And so you and I and, you know, Brody Guy, who was the CEO of Coast Funds at the time, had to have a real lot of tough discussions with people to get them to understand how important their voice was. So maybe just share some context around, you know, you talked about the various communities that you got to go work with to help develop the book. Maybe just a little bit about that, getting people to be comfortable in telling that story after the table was sort of set. I think that's a bit of an interesting nuance. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it was such a, an amazing process. I mean, from the idea of the book was born probably about seven or eight years ago, but the real work on the book took about three years in total from 
introducing myself to the people who are in the book. I knew many of them as well, but having making those connections to seeing the book out in, in print, truly a labour of love. Uh, and I don't say that as a cliche because you really have to love the stories, you have to love the people that are involved, and you have to have the utmost integrity and respect for who they are. So, so there's, there's. I would say the, the biggest challenge actually was that um, just after I started work on the book uh, was the start of the pandemic. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and so the entire process had to be done through uh, Zoom calls and video conferencing and telephone calls and Facebook chats and you name it, every known form of technology, which is remarkable in, in um a world where I much prefer to be sitting down face to face, obviously, with people and having that intimacy, but it worked. And uh, I think people were so the silver lining to being in the pandemic is that people had time on their hands and got very engaged. And I'd, I'd get off a call, but it took me a few months to get Chief Patty Walker from Guasolanakura on the phone. But after the first two hour chat, before he hung up, he said, Okay, same time next week. <laughs> and we did that for we did that for a number of weeks until he had the chance to fully tell a story. And I think listening is a huge part of how you succeed in making people comfortable that you truly, truly listen to the stories. One thing that people made very clear to me is that while I, I didn't want negativity associated with the book, while I really wanted to showcase hope, is I think Jessie Hemphill put it the best way when she said, you can't set the table for the future until you've cleared it of the past. Mm. And everybody had to talk about the trauma and impact of colonization in order to set the context for talking about the future. So that was very important to honor that in the stories. And my my approach to these and amplifying Indigenous voices, and, and it's a timely conversation in a time when the conversation about pretendianism and cultural appropriation is so large and, and the um, absolutely bottom line principle that, you know, in writing and publishing, I can't do further harm. So I employed a fully 360 degree permission and reciprocity process and in, in doing this writing with everybody I worked with. And I do deliberately use the term writing with as opposed to writing about. And so every story that was developed, everybody got to say yes or no to absolutely everything in there, even the photographs. Uh, every word was checked, the story plan, the general direction, how their story fit in with everybody else's because there's a huge diversity of stories in there. And, and I'll come back to that because that, that's leading a little bit to, you know, talking about helping people feel comfortable with everybody's stories in the book and history and, and where they fit within that and the importance of their voices being heard. So permission for absolutely everything. If somebody had wanted to withdraw their story at the last minute, and there were a couple of uh, potentials for that to happen at, at, the, at the last minute, that was absolutely their prerogative and um, would be honoured. And that helped build a huge amount of comfort, I think, as we went through the process that I was clearly honouring that, as well as the reciprocity of ensuring that everybody um, would, I would return in some way, shape and form, some gratitude in, in a meaningful way for people taking the time to share their stories. So the royalties from the book are all being donated to the Coast Opportunities Conservation Fund. So that's one way of returning, um, that everybody got copies of the book uh, that I've offered to come and speak in the communities or do some work in the communities uh, as a way of saying thank you. So by the time we got to the 11th hour, which is when people, as you say, realise, oh, I'm actually going to be in a real book. And 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 the diversity of, of people's stories in the book was very important to get non-Indigenous readers to appreciate that diversity. Mm -hmm. so there isn't and to dispel some of the myths, if you like, about Indigenous worldviews of conservation, land management and protection, and the different ways in which people go about healing their trauma and protecting their people. So we have a huge diversity of stories from people like uh, Jess Hapsty talking about the children's uh, cultural camps, Quay Camp and, and the Cook Society, and her leadership as a young woman in 
reconnection to the land and how important it is to protect ancient lands and waters and systems, particularly since they've been through the trauma of devastating oil spills in their territory, for example. And then you have Chief Chris Roberts, way I come, living in Campbell River, it's incredibly commercialised, industrialised landscape. And how do you uh, take your people forward into economic prosperity, into human well-being, into protection of the landscape when you're dealing with those kind of challenges? Uh, you know, Chief Crystal Smith in Kitimat and Isla Territory and, and Hanakalia Territory and how hard they've worked to protect the landscape and their territories from further degradation from all the absolutely incredibly industrialised landscape that's been imposed across the top of them and the impacts on their community of that with incredibly horrific suicide rates, high, high unemployment rates, terrible things that have happened in their community and the leadership of her predecessor as Chief Alice Ross and, and how they've seen their vision of the future. These are incredibly diverse stories. And then there's... Um, Kyori Nelson in, uh, in Hara rebuilding this incredibly beautiful healing lodge and economic tourism opportunity. Uh, and, and these stories are also different. And as people started to understand what was sharing their stories and that diversity, there were concerns. You know, there were questions around are we compromising ourselves by being side by side with people telling stories? Of, of their pathways forward, not necessarily being ones that we would endorse. In the end, you know, you and I did a lot of work together to help people feel, as you said, understand how important it is just to tell their own stories. And, and these stories really focus around individuals who have shown incredible leadership. People like Chris Desmond, people like Jess Housty, people like Charity. And people like yourself, you know, I, I thought it was so important that you do forward and tell that story of the history of the Great Bear Rainforest, the Great Bear, the, the, the land use agreements and, and the challenges that you faced. I mean, you tell a story about walking into a room. I hope it's okay to, you should tell the story on this podcast early in those negotiations. <laughs> you tell that story because I think it helps listeners really understand what you were up against. No, true. I mean, that's, you know, the first days of the LRMP process, I was a 21-year-old First Nations leader who was just sort of the only warm body to be thrown at a number of countless provincial tables that were up at the time because of consultation concerns and things like that. And um, I walked into the room and it was a very, very non-native room, I guess is what, one way I'd put it. And I walked over and some guys offered me to sit down. And so I sat down with a few folks and um, just, hey, how you doing? It's going to be weird. All these people working together, just kind of chit-chatting a little bit. And then Dr. Chief Robert Joseph walked in the room and I believe Chief Pat Alford was behind him and a couple other of our leaders had sort of walked in and the guy leaned over me and says, hey, can you believe they let these goddamn Indians into this planning process? And I just kind of looked, you sons of bitches, eh? And so I got up and excused myself politely, and I went and gave Bobby Joe, my the, like my uncle Bobby Joe, the biggest hug I think I've ever given him, just because one, I was so happy to see him because I felt safe in the room, um, but then two, just the it was a time for the tables to turn. It was a time for First Nations voices to be heard, as opposed to just be at a table, kind of complying with government or ingo or industry direction. Um, I wish I grew up a little bit quicker because. I kind of sat and watched for the first six years before I found my voice as, as a bit of a leader. But, um, you know, that's kind of the world we lived in at the time. But, you know, you, you're helping us with so many things with Namakos Council, helping us out with some communications. I know the work we're doing on the PFP work for the Great Bear Sea. Um, just for the listeners, the Great Bear Rainforest Agreement had what's called the Coast Opportunity Fund. It's a $120 million economic development fund that was created for the terrestrial protection and management of resources within the Great Bear Rainforest. But as many of you have heard, you know, and I'm starting to understand, we're holistic people. We don't stop at the tide mark. 
you know, our, our near shore, our foreshore is just as important as the riparian zones. And so the elders were very clear to us that we needed to continue with a marine component. And we're getting so close to being able to be in a position to announce what the Great Bear Sea PFP would look like. And the Great Bear, the coast of British Columbia will eventually hold two of the first seven project for permanences in the world. And so there's a bit of leadership that the communities that you really help tell the stories to show that we're not just a homogenized group in the Great Bear Sea. There's different languages, there's different people, but we've managed to cohabitate for 14,000 years, which makes the place special just from that point of view. But we've also started a tract that's going to help us manage for the next 14,000 years. And we're delighted, what do they say, um, the sincerest form of flattery is, is copying. And so, you know, we're starting to see other indigenous groups around the world take the lead of the nations within the Great Bear Rainforest. And I want to thank you for helping us in the role that you play to helping some of these things come forward. But just as you're, you know, I, I see time starting to become a bit of an enemy and I definitely want to have you in again. Um, maybe you might be able to write the foreword for my book and we can talk about that in one of the future episodes. <laughs> but maybe just, just, just a minute on just some of the stuff you're working for us right now and, and what's keeping you busy. You bet. Um, well, I'll just do a very quick plug. I think, you know, times have changed since the, the day that you had that experience. And I think it shows in that the book, This Place is Who We Are, has just been nominated for an award in the, by the Prince George Public Library, the Gene Clark Publication Award. And I think that says a lot that books like this are being nominated for awards and that people are... You know, the awareness is, is getting there. And I hope everybody who's listening goes, runs out and gets a copy and, and reads it. Apart from anything else, the royalties go to the Conservation Fund. But, you know, there's so many exciting things happening right now. And you mentioned project finance with permanence. You know, Coast Funds is a world leader in setting out the system where, you know, we, we have conservation financing working together with... Um, sustainable resource use but that's that that sounds you know the people listening that that's a big topic what does it look like in the field and on the ground what it looks like is our land and water guardians the Hamaya stewardship network those men and women and, and some of them are as young as 18 years old and some of them are you know former commercial fisher people who are in their late 50s or early 60s and they've got so much knowledge and experience and these people are the ones who know the land and water the absolute best. And they are taking back management literally by having their feet on the ground, their boats on the water, monitoring the territory, undertaking scientific research, sharing Indigenous knowledge and ways of being with our partners in the BC government, the Canadian government, who also have responsibility in those areas. Very exciting work to be involved in and to showcase. And people who want to learn more can just go to the Numcolis website, numcolis.com, and they can read lots of stories about this great work that's happening. That's great stuff, Catherine. I really want to thank you for joining us on Res Dog Walkers and look forward to having you again with us in the future. And also just want to thank you for the work that you're helping us do. We have such a beautiful story to tell and to have someone as talented as you help us break it down and tell it the way it needs to be told. Um, is something that we definitely don't take for granted. So I know we both got other things we got to do, but I look forward to talking to you soon, my friend. Kia Kessel. My great pleasure. Thanks, Dallas. Kia ora. Right. Talk soon. Thanks, bye Catherine. bye. That's Catherine Gordon, author of This Place is Who We Are. And if you didn't notice, when we said it three or four times, I did write the forward for that story. It was my first writing venture, and it was a exciting time in the growth of my career and so i really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this tremendous project oh, hey, oh, hey, yeah. gayla casa thank you so much ronnie and Catherine, for being on the show today and i really hope i can get you on our agenda for bc irock in nanaimo in april i really want to thank our listeners for tuning in don't miss out on the 9th bc indigenous resource opportunities conference bc irock coming soon to Nanaimo, BC, April 24th to 26th of 2024. Since the beginning of the conference series, many successful partnerships now exist that bring significant benefits to First Nations resource developers, businesses, and all levels of government. 
BCI Rock lays the foundation for future partnerships and benefits for First Nations in the resource sector. Visit our website at www.bcirock.ca to learn more. Oh, hey, oh, hey, hey.